I'll be going to obviously look at one thirty five. It's not one hour fifteen from here. <laughs> Steve, I'm just going to see if I can uh, change to my PowerPoint here in a second. Yep. Do that. So you're seeing you're seeing your PowerPoint. Uh, I was. I was. Okay. I'll, I'll uh, wonder if I can sort of set you up here a little higher and you can sort of see more of us here. I'll, I'll show you the, the class here in a second where we're congregating. But uh, it'll be interesting if you can see more of us. See that? There you are. There I am. Sort of. Let's see. I'm on sharing, so let me stop now. There I am. Yeah. And there I am in the same frame. All right. There you are. Look at this. See, I can point. <laughs> no, not the other way. I can point it that way. I'm poking okay. Steve. Right. It's like ET. You know. <laughs> Okay, okay, your professors are being silly, but they've just discovered this technology. I know, they're, there they are. Yeah, look, like, we're old nerds, what do you expect, you yeah, know? It's expect. like, a, hey, how you doing? <laughs> this is my first time in Shreveport. Yeah, that's right. Uh -huh. This is it. And, uh, yeah, Steve, tell them where you are. Okay, folks, I'm in, uh, I'm Steve Ajar, and I'm in Lexington, Virginia. The Washington Lane. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, we've, we've got two minutes left till class starts. Uh, but you've seen the class now. I'm going to hit these lights, make you a little bit more vivid on the screen. That should knock everything off. Yeah, that's looking better. Um, And uh, I'm going to give them, Steve, I, I give them quizzes before uh, we start every class or at the beginning of every class. And so I've, I've made a little quiz just to see if you got through the reading. Not necessarily if you understood the equations, but if you read it, right? That's what we're after. Um, that's what Dr. Desjardins is here to help us out with, but the equations and something like that. I have, I have a few questions at the end of this. Nothing technical, more of the uh, philosophical. Will robots eat our brains? Good. 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 I like that. Um, all right, got another student coming in. We're almost ready to go. But uh, uh, Steve, we had we had another student drop, so we've had two drops. Um, before they even looked at the physics readings, okay? So it's not no. your fault. It's not your fault. Now we're in trouble. Yeah. But uh, the, the other one didn't show last time, guys, so it's only Abby that. Um, I get this drop, I just walk in the room. Uh-huh. I'll bet. I'll bet. It's weird seeing myself delayed. Oh, are you a little delayed? Yeah. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not. We're not here. So now we have everybody. Z is here. So we've got everybody here. Um, and uh, that's right. We're putting our cell phones on mute. Now, Steve, I, I am recording you. Uh, you can see with the. There's my sort of 
camera there yeah. on the laptop. Um, just more for for our colleagues, and if we take snippets from this later, you know, just as, as a record of what we're doing. Um, and yes, we can film students during discussion. Right? They'd love this, the FaceTime a little bit. Yeah, sure. no, maybe not. Okay. Well. Um, but uh, um, we'll start off with the uh, with the quiz, and then we'll 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 let Dr. Desjardins take it away, um, and uh, we'll hang on. Right? We'll hang on. We're doing <laughs> physics, by God. I mean, this qualifies as physics, doesn't it, Dr. Desjardins? Oh, no. Yeah, it's definitely. Right? It's physics. That's right. That's right. Okay. So I'm going to walk you through the quiz. Here we go. Okay. Quiz number two. Whoa. I think I got six questions for you. At the beginning of today's reading, we learned about how systems are A, entropic or synthetic, <coughs> B, opened or closed, C, organic or artificial, D, both measurable and immeasurable. Question number two, the following was not among the concepts we read about. Cover your answers as you go, please. A, mass momentum, B, orbits, C, time series, D, state variables. Number three, Demonstrating the difference between a conservative system and one that is both dissipative and driven was an example of two A, planets, B, swans, C, chemical elements, D, tanks of water. <coughs> Number four, one kind of shape that describes the steady state of a system in addition to a fixed point and a closed loop is called a A, chi-square, B, lambda, C, torus, D, zenith. Number five, one characteristic of phase space we read about was its a, tipping point, B, mode value, C, interconnectedness, D, dimensionality. Now this next question is going to go behind Desjardins' window there. I'm afraid if I close it, I'm going to lose him forever. So I don't know what I'm going to do here. Can you just move it? Oh, that's a good idea. <laughs> that's a good idea. Just move it. Okay. Move me. There I go. <laughs> the last phenomenon we read about was A, emergence, B, network bridging, C, strange attractors, D, entropy. Okay. All right. That's it. Turn over your papers, please. Turn over your papers, please. Hand them in. <coughs> okay, and we always go over the, the answers. We could, we could ask uh, Dr. DeJardins if, if he knows the answers to these, but... Uh, I had to remember my own reading. Since he, since, that's right, since he did it. But All right, at the beginning of today's reading, we learned about how systems are... What was that? Uh, B, open or closed. That's right, Daphne. That's right. Two, the following was not among the concepts we read about. We didn't read about what? Math. Yes, A, mass momentum. Mass momentum. We sure read about orbits and state variables. Maybe time series you don't remember as well. Maybe that was a hard one there. but 
three, demonstrating the difference between a conservative system and one that is both dissipative and driven. Uh, I, I predict this will be the one that was sort of easiest for you if you did the reading. Okay. D, yeah, tanks of water, yeah. That was a vivid example. We, we, we like that, Dr. Desjardins. We like that. Tanks of water, good. Yeah. Tanks for the memory. That's right. One, character <laughs> one characteristic of Faye's face we read about was it? Wait, what? We skipped four. 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 Yeah. I'm four. Oh, did we skip four? Yeah. Oh, sorry. One kind of shape that describes the steady shape of a system in addition to a fixed point and a closed loop is C, torus, right, like a donut, right? One characteristic of phase space we read about was its D, D, dimensionality. Now, you may be confused about what that concept means, but that is what we talked about. Um, the last phenomenon we read about was C, strange attractors. That's right. That's right. Okay. You're doing all right on that. That's good. That's good. Very good. Um. All right. So, we're shifting it over to Dr. Desardens, and uh, great. Okay, well, they've, so they've shown they've done the reading, Steve. Yep. They didn't show that they necessarily don't have any questions or are completely clear about it, but, <laughs> but that, that's, that's where you come in, yeah, right? Yeah. So take it away. We can hear you. Okay, good. And, and yeah, tell, that, tell us, uh, I'm sorry, I, I should introduce you a little bit more. You're a professor of chemistry. Dr. Zardes is a professor of chemistry, physical chemistry. He's a physical chemist at Washington and Lee. And Lee. You've probably been there over, maybe over 20 years. Uh, Very Wow, over 30 years at Washington and Lee in Virginia. Uh, very, very fine institution there, a liberal arts college like ourselves. And uh, yeah, I don't know, anything else you want to give as an intro to yourself? How'd you get into this stuff? You know. uh, I read a book in the late 80s. Huh? <laughs> I read a book called Chaos by the James, of the New Times James by Dean Fleet. Yeah. And I offered a course on chaos for the first time in 1989. So think wow. about that, kids. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. But that was a famous book. It was a famous book. A lot of us read it. I mean, I read it, uh, James Blake's Chaos. I didn't really see how it linked to some of the stuff today, but I can see now sort of how it does. Uh, yeah. All right. All right. I'll start up. OK, folks, let me start by um, apologizing for the reading. Um, those actually, now many of those readings come from readings I use in my chaos class, and that is of course aimed at non-majors. That does not mean that they follow it instantly on the first try either. Um, these are some pretty spacey concepts we get into sometimes. And I, what I'm going to try to do today is not necessarily go through everything you did in the reading today, but goes through some examples of how these pieces work. What's really important here is that you feel free to interrupt me and ask a question. So just signal to Dr. Lauren on that side, and he will interrupt me if you're afraid to just scream out and stop. Yep, we'll got that, guys? You promised to do that? That's right. Good. Okay, so I'm going to switch over to the PowerPoint here. Let's see if I can make this work. There's my screen. Share screens. Can we go with the PowerPoint up? And I can start. Excellent. Okay. Um, so it goes with the famous line from Kurt, many of Kurt Vonnegut's novels. He was very fond of that. And talked about simply about the strange way the universe evolved with time. And of course, that's the first place we want to go with this. Okay, and I talk about this with Dean, I'm going to talk about the screen here. The aim of physical science is predictability. Uh, one of the earliest things that happened with physics, starting with Galileo, Copernicus, Kepler, were the attempts to predict the behavior of celestial bodies, the stars, the moon, whatever, 
in a mathematical way. In other words, they could say, tomorrow night that star is going to be right here in the sky. Um, the trick was, they were all very good at this, but they didn't produce a method by which other people could do this. That's what Newton did. Newton came up with a, a, a general methodology to let anybody try to represent the universe in a quantitative way. Now, to see this, now, Steve, Steve, can I ask you yeah. a quick question? Will you sure. will you make these slides available to the students? Absolutely. Yeah. I should have done that ahead of time, and I totally forgot. I, I apologize. We um, we're registering today for classes, so I'm uh, I'm a little splattered right now. I'm sorry. Just just so they know, they don't have to write down every word of the of the slides. Not at all. In fact, I'll, in the future, I'll get to the slides for a little before so you can print them out. Okay. Okay. Um, what Newton did was, in the case of the most general way, he abstracted the behavior of specific things and universal principles. One way to think about this was you always hear the famous story of Newton sitting under the apple tree and the apple hits him on his head and he said, oh, gravity. It's like, well, he was probably pretty, pretty obvious he'd been hit on the head with an apple. The insight he actually had, though, that they're referring to was that the whatever principle made the apple fall to the ground was the same principle that kept the moon orbiting around the earth in other words the law of gravity <coughs> now um you know this is just basic scientific methodology in the natural science we test our models empirically okay so we we make a prediction in other words we have some picture mental picture of how nature works we make a prediction about what one property will be at some point in the future. We actually do the experiment, measure the property. If the number is agreed to within a certain precision, we consider that a confirming instance of the model. Now, one really important point, I'm going to put it down here, is right over here. We use a model appropriate to the desired level of precision. This allows for approximation. This sounds obvious, but it's a lot trickier than it looks. In other words, like for example, the most obvious approximation we make is that we separate the little pendulum we're trying to describe from the whole universe. In other words, we don't take into account what the position of the moon is doing to the pendulum. We assume we can ignore that. Okay? If you couldn't, that would mean any physical model whatsoever would have to model the entire universe, which is obviously computationally impossible for us. Now, big question here. Do we get truth, which is air quotes I'm making here, or just increasingly better models? Oh, oh, okay. oh I, I know the answer to that question. With that? <laughs> I want, uh, do, would you guys predict the answer to that question? Yeah, I think so. Zeke, one that? of the students said increasingly better models. <coughs> and, I would, and I would agree with that. All right. <laughs> truth, truth is tricky. Okay, it's one of those things. Um, we do get increasingly better models. We can make better predictions, but the difficulty is always a prediction is a well understood thing. You can see how close you were to what really happened. So, for example, if the Weather Service predicts a hurricane is going to hit Orlando, okay, we'll see if it hits Orlando or not. Um, the truth of how a hurricane works, though, is a much trickier business. Probably because, again, our models are always a little bit approximate. Okay, so just quickly how this works, what Newton did, and don't go too nuts about this. And I emphasize, I'm, using, I'm showing you equations, but equations are just the way we write these things down. I'm not going to expect you to solve anything. So what Newton's thought was that bodies move because of the actions of forces. The force is either a push or a pull. So you push on something, or you pull on something and it moves through space. Newton's most important law was force equals mass times acceleration. If you apply an object, uh, a force to an object with a mass, it will accelerate. In other words, it will change velocity. Okay, and that's a, that's a very simple example. Um, here's an example. Don't freak out. I know there's derivatives there. Uh, you're not going to do any calculus, but hey, I mean, you know, like union rules. I have to have calculus on every slide at some point. So, 
Here's this little guy going back and forth. It's attached to a spring. Assume there's no friction down here. So he goes back and forth. Okay. So his position gets higher, then gets lower, then gets higher, then gets lower. Similarly, velocity will go in this direction, but slow down, stop, go in the other direction, slow down, go back in the other direction. Now, according to Newton, what we have to do is we can describe this system by solving simultaneously these two equations. This is the force equals mass times acceleration, where acceleration is the time derivative of velocity, how velocity changes the time. And velocity is just the spatial derivative of a velocity. Uh, sorry, of position. When we solve those two differential equations, and you don't have to do it, but what happens is you get two functions. You get position as a function of time and velocity as a function of time. That's our answer. We can predict, we can say two hours from now the position will be this and the velocity will be that. Okay, that's what we mean to make a prediction about the pendulum. Now, in reality, don't worry about this again, but I'm just showing you this. Um, these are numerical solutions. The problem was for many, many centuries, a couple of centuries, was that you could write down these differential equations from Newton's law of the motion to describe how something moves with time. The problem was we couldn't solve them. The 19th century was devoted largely, mathematically speaking, to solving differential equations. However, in the 20th century, we developed computers, digital computers. Digital computers were a tremendous advance because of this reason. Any differential equation or any set of differential equations can be turned into a lot of arithmetic. If you're a human being with a pencil, a million pieces of arithmetic is a really rotten idea. <laughs> human being with a digital computer, however, is a really good idea. And that, that's the change that began to occur. By the 60s, <coughs> we had digital computers that could solve seriously sets of different equations that we couldn't even think about touching before. And better, it could solve them with less level of approximation. So, so here's what you get. So, so. Hmm? Steve, I mean that—that's—that's uh, that's why we couldn't do a lot of the stuff that we're doing now with regard to computer models, right? Like, yeah. like, like, a, like, a, like the weather. You mentioned the weather in your reading, right? And Lorenz's very simple model, but but now you can, you mentioned thousands of variables in like the National Weather Service's models. Absolutely. And I think if I remember the prediction, by 2030, we should have, the prediction is we will have a computer capable of doing 10 to the 24th, in other words, a trillion, trillion floating point operations per second. Floating point operation is an addition, subtraction, multiplication, division. Our current computers work in the teraflop range, so they can do trillions of calculations per second. By 2030, it'll be trillions of trillions. That is normally seen as the threshold we will be able to model the entire atmosphere at a reasonable level. Predictions should get a lot better because you can finally take into account what happens when the set goes all the way around and comes back on the other side. But we're not there yet. Right. So here's what it looks like, by the way. A numerical solution produces a series of numbers. Okay, so this, this is the value of position versus time in this axis. You can plot them and you get that graph. That's all we're getting. So we would say the position goes back and forth and what it's from the Okay. Now, a key thing we have to be able to do here is, as I mentioned earlier, is separate the system from the surroundings. Now, remember, this is a very general concept. We think of there being an entire universe. A little piece of it in our case, the spring, for example, is the thing we're trying to describe. Everything else is the surroundings. We assume that we can model our system with minimal description of the surroundings. In other words, I can deal with my spring without having to describe what's going on in Cleveland. All right? And that seems like a really good idea. It turns out to be much harder than we thought it was. Okay, so again, principles of modeling. Again, the same concept is here. What we think of is 
when I say we solve this problem, we think of generating a series of snapshots. So imagine getting a series of tiny little pictures, okay, that are all separated by a certain amount in time. So you've probably all seen these things where you take a pad and you flick it and someone's made a lot of drawings all one slightly ahead of the other. It's exactly that, okay? Or it's just like a plain old movie. You have a series of images, we play them at 24 frames per second, and your brain interprets that as motion. Well, that's exactly what we solve for here. We, we generate a series of snapshots, okay? And the N in these equations tells you what frame you are viewing. So if you want to know what's going on an hour from now, you figure out how many little time steps you have will add up to an hour, look up that N frame, and it will tell you what you're going to be doing. That's your prediction about the future. Trick to this is, we need state variables. When a, when a scientist talks about the state of the system, they mean, well, how do we describe what the system is doing right now? For our spring, the state variable would be its position and its velocity. That would be enough to tell you what the spring is doing. It also would be enough to make predictions about the spring's behavior at all points in the future. Now, if you were trying to describe the U.S. economy, that's a much bigger trick, okay? You need a lot of state variables. You want to try to describe this at the consumer level, you would have to describe things like every person in the United States, their buying habits, how much money in their checking account, what's their credit limit, so on and so forth. That would be a much more complicated system to try to describe. Or, if you want to look at it this way, if you have a a certain amount of gas, and I mean like a certain amount of oxygen, okay? Um, six gallons of oxygen roughly has a trillion, trillion particles. If you wanted to describe that in all its glory, you would have to literally just give me the position and velocity of a trillion, trillion different particles. Okay, so there are all different levels at which we can describe this. One little note here, Okay, this sounds trivial, but again, it would be important. The initial values of the state variables are called the initial condition. Notice, you cannot predict where you are now. When you start, you simply have to measure the values of the state variables. Okay, you can't predict those, so you have to know where you start. Knowing where you start allows you to predict every place you will be in the future. Sorry, Steve, the, the, your image is over the PowerPoint there. I can't figure out how to move it. But really? All right. Well, it's, it's just over this. It says, note that the initial values of the state variables, da 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 Call initial condition. There we go. Got it. Must be given. OK. <laughs> OK, just didn't take note of it. State variables are different from something called a parameter. And notice there's a lot more detail in these slides than you need to know. But I, since you'll be reading them, I wanted them to connect. A parameter is like mass. It's a variable, it looks like a state variable, except in principle it doesn't change with time. So you don't worry about the mass changing with time, you worry about the position changing with time. So when you hear me say a parameter, that's literally what it is. It's something you set right at the beginning, and then you allow the system to change with time. It's funny, in, in statistics they often talk about how parameters are qualities of the environment that you're sort of trying to estimate with your measures. Mm -hmm. um, and so they may change yeah. over time, but that's a part of the environment that changes over time. Right. This yeah. group, when we call something a parameter, we assume it doesn't change over okay. time. If okay. it does, it's a state variable. So, so let me so. pause for a second, Steve, and just make sure everybody gets what state variables are. Um, okay. I think it's really interesting, I think it's sort of fascinating about being able to describe different systems, if you will, in terms of what are the important state variables. So at first I was thinking, during the reading, I was thinking about weather. Mm -hmm. and, and when you said there are thousands of variables in you know, the National Weather Center's models, I'm thinking, well, what would some of those variables do? I mean, be. Uh, and so I'm they thinking. Would, they would be. Um, Temperature, pressure, wind speed, wind direction. Those are and you can almost picture. Yeah, those are state variables. 
Yeah, you would picture, or like, suppose you had little weather sensors stuck in the ground every foot. So imagine covering the earth with a grid with the little squares of one, of one foot across. At the corner of every square, you put a little weather sensor that can tell you temperature, humidity, wind speed, wind direction, so on and so forth. Extend that model up into the atmosphere. Okay, oh, you have God. all these bazillions of pieces of data. Yeah, see, I didn't That's do probably. that. In my mind, I was, I did, I did that for temperature, barometric pressure, wind speed, I forgot about direction, and I had them like a mile apart. So each thing was a mile apart. And then I didn't think about going up in the atmosphere, but of course you would want to do that too, right? Actually, a mile apart is not a bad, it, it, you're a lot more realistic than I'm being. Well, you're a physicist okay, it, or a physical chemist, so of course you're unrealistic. It's hard to do that. Well, we would never have weather sensors that are part like that, but we'd have to have the satellite that could measure, that could discern the values of what's going on in the atmosphere. Wherever. At that level. That's not impossible, but um, the weather is very difficult to predict. Any small changes and any small uncertainties, like in other words, what's going on between the weather sensors, eventually come to ruin your prediction. Mm -hmm. and, and so other state variables, things like, um, uh, well, how many cars are on the roads uh, in an area? How fast they're going? Traffic model, sure. You know, and and a, and a human a human system and or you know a human being. You know, what's you know how how many hours sleep did you get last night? And when have you last eaten? And you know, we could go on and on, right? But well, well, think of how we describe your health. First thing we do in the hospital, they measure your blood pressure, they take your temperature. In other words, we call them the vitals. Mm -hmm. So vitals are a very basic state description of what's happening to a human being right now. Okay. So if your heart rate was zero, you'd be dead. Yeah. <coughs> okay. Good. So now, just the other part. Okay, hold on, hold on. We got a question, uh, Maddie. Oh, sure. Okay. Sorry. What are parameters? What are parameters? Parameters are just numbers that don't change with time. So, for example, um, if you have a little ball bouncing along. It's got a velocity and a position, but it also has a mass. It weighs a certain amount, but that doesn't change with time. You could set that up at the beginning. You would weigh your ball and say, okay, the ball weighs eight grams, and then move on from there. So a parameter is a, a piece of information you use to describe the system, but it doesn't change with time. Is that good? Yes, good. Yeah, that. yeah. So if we're if we're looking to describe centenary, it might be the buildings and the geographic space and stuff like that. The students go up and down, enrollments and so on, um, or the vitals as well. Stuff like I don't know how old I am, or more permanent stuff. What did you see? I mean, where is Darren College? Where where is it? The tree for? I mean that no. that's a classic parameter value. Mm -hmm. okay. All right. The other thing is, aside from the specification of the state, which is the set of the state variables, you need something called the dynamics. Dynamics are simply the rules you use to determine how the state variables change with time. So we'll use the example you've seen so far with those sets of equations I gave you. You'll often hear in physics referred to as equations of motion. So you, you feed the state in, the equations of motion, then we'll spit out a new set of values for the state variables. Those will be the later values. So as the system changes with time, okay, the state variables change their values. That's exactly what the dynamics predicts. And it, they're usually equations. So are we good with are we good with this? Yeah, yeah. So so for example, one rule that would be a dynamic part of the dynamics of my physical system would be the bigger the lunch I eat, the sleepier I get later, within limits, right? There's a ceiling curve or whatever. But you could say something like that, right? Sure. We could we could track your um, your blood sugar levels and how they correlate with certain neurotransmitter concentrations that would make you sleepy. Mm -hmm. And the state exactly how you create something like that. And the that. state variables would be, you know, size of the lunch, you know, caloric intake, and then sleepiness. 
right? So it's just or, I, I would suspect what we would use would be, for example, blood sugar level and neurotransmitter concentration. Mm -hmm. So in other words, now we're given that you have this much sugar in your system, how much of each neurotransmitter do you have? So ne certain neurotransmitters will make you sleepy or not. Mm -hmm. And then an another state variable might be the time of day, or that might be a parameter, but, uh, and so that around midday, you feel more drowsy, even regardless of, of the size of lunch. You can eat, have eaten nothing, and you'll feel somewhat drowsy at this time of day. Sure, absolutely. Yeah. And then you age, the age of the person, and so on. Yeah, okay. And again, parameters would be exactly what you're saying. For that kind of model, your age would be a parameter. Does your age change with time? Sure, but not appreciably during the time you're trying to make a prediction. You see what I'm saying? Yep. Yep. You're not. We don't worry about you being. You're older at the end of the day, but that's not something we should have to worry about. Yeah. Okay. Um, now. Often we do this, we represent our results graphically, and there's a good reason for that. The entire back half of your brain is devoted to interpreting visual data. We're a very visual species. So if I show you a table of numbers, it doesn't make a lot of sense. If I put it on a graph, you go, oh, to, oh gosh, look, it oscillates. So here's an example. If you plot the state variable versus time, that's called a time series. So you have x versus t or v versus t. Principally, you can plot them both versus time, but that gets a little hard to visualize. Instead, what you could do is plot velocity versus position. In other words, plot the state variables against each other and don't have a time axis. That would be equivalent to putting your eye right over here and looking down the time axis. What you would see is a loop, okay? When you plot the state variables against each other, we call it a phase-based plot. And here's why that's useful. Notice that every point in phase space, that point right there, for example, represents a value of velocity and a value of position. That is a possible state of the system. Any point in phase space tells you the value of all the state variables. So that's why this was sometimes called state space. Okay, so what this is saying is, this is how the, these are the possible states of the system my pendulum can mention, can, uh, God, sorry, excuse me, can visit. What that means is anytime we have pendular motion, spring motion, or what is generically called periodic motion, you will see a closed loop in phase space. This represents all the states the system visits before it comes back to the initial point and then repeats itself. That's the advantage of phase space. You can tell, for example, if your system is periodic because you see a closed loop. Okay, we'll talk a little bit more about that. But phase space is, if you will, the ultimate way to visualize motion. Okay, question about that. I mean, phase space, I realize that's the Star Trek word of all time, but it's, it, it'll come back in various ways. Can you, can you give an example um, about, I mean, of phase space and, and sort of where it comes back around. I'm thinking about the human body, but I guess also ecosystems and stuff like that. Look, and this is the interesting part. Phase space predicts certain things. You can see a point, you can see a loop. It doesn't have to be an even loop. Don't forget, this could be a rather irregular loop. You can see a tori of some complexity, or you can see a strange attractor. Whether you're talking about the weather, an ecosystem, a rackety spring, so on any of those, you will see one of those four kinds of behavior. That's all you can do in phase space mathematically. That's one of the really interesting parts, is if you think about plotting things in this fashion, there's only so many kinds of objects you can see. Oh, so okay. So I didn't know that. So that, that's the limit of sort of forms that phase space can take. Fixed point, a loop, a, a torus of, of some kind, and a strange attractor, right? Right. Now, now one interesting thing about this, okay? If you th uh, the torus is 
a periodic system with more than one period. So this period, so this is how long it takes to start here and go all the way around and return to that initial point. That's called the period of the system. It's the length of time before it repeats itself. For a torus, you have two. You would have, remember, picture a donut. You would have the cross <coughs> section of the donut, which was a little circle, and you would have the diameter of the entire donut, that circumference, which is a big circle. So that torus would have two periods. How long it takes you, I, I wish I had the torus picture here, but I saved that for later. Okay, you would have the little period and the bigger period. Now, of course, you can have a system with three periods, or four periods, or 18 billion periods. It makes the torus, but of course, the torus has a higher dimensionality. Now, I know, I apologize, I, if you think I can visualize this, I appreciate the respect, but I can't. <laughs> I just acknowledge the trend. Just as a regular donut has a surface and lives in a three-dimensional space, you can picture a, a higher dimensional torus whose quote-unquote surface is volume and who lives in a four-dimensional space. Which so you're, which I, you're, and you're acknowledging you can't really imagine that. Oh, of course not. Yeah, and so I, I, I love that in the reading. Did you guys not love that when, when you know, so because you're a mere mortal, you know, like I am or whatever, we can't we can't imagine that. But mathematics makes it easy to play in that world, right? Well, the, the problem is two people say, well, up in the world, how, why do you need to know anything beyond three-dimensional? And the answer is simply, yeah, if you're trying to describe the position of a single particle in space, you always need three coordinates. But if you're trying to describe the behavior of two particles in space, you need six coordinates. Okay, three for one, three for the other. So your mathematics is six-dimensional at that point, whether you like that or not. So the mathematicians, fortunately, have worked out all this multi-dimensional mathematics for us so that we can cheerfully go along and make this work. Um, and computers made this even easier. Computers let us compute god-awful complicated systems. Okay, and just look at little pieces of it. Sometimes the problem with the computer is we get a lot of data and we don't know how to display it. Because of course, human beings cannot visualize the greater than three dimensions. So yeah. it's always an interesting question, how do you display six-dimensional data? And, and, and I was, I remember uh, being taught multiple regression um, and thinking about a an x-axis and a y-axis, like as you go up in education, you increase in income. Um, but then there are these other variables that have to take on other dimensions. And they're going in different dimensions, like oh, out from the board or into the board. And so it becomes a really complicated uh, view. Um, but it's sort of easy when you've got all the variables and stuff to to crunch the numbers on it and make a prediction based on all those different state variables, basically. All right. Actually, let me give you now just what you see now, and then we'll go off in different directions. You're saying, what does this have to do with complexity? Right now, we are figuring out how we describe the behavior of a simple system, a system with a few state variables. A complex system has exactly the same description except there are many, many state variables. Now why this is critical is we're about to move into looking at a simple system, a system with a single state variable, whose behavior is arbitrarily complicated. Okay, now that, you would think simple systems would have simple behavior, you would need lots of state variables to com get complicated behavior. It turns out that's not the case. A simple system can be too complex for all the computers on Earth to handle. Mm. And I'm going to give you that very simple example now. And it won't be a physics exam, because quite frankly, physics is you know, boring and has different equations. Let's look at something different. Hell with differential equations. Let's go for a different equation. Here's how a different equation works. You have some function over here of x. You feed it a value of x, let's say 7. You feed 7 into function, let's say f is x squared. 
So you feed in 7, okay, you square it, and the answer is 49. So that means that x0, the first x is 7, the second 0 is 49. The third value, the, second, the next value, will be feed in 49, square that, who knows, okay, and get the value after that. This is called <coughs> a difference equation. All right, and that process of plugging it in and predicting the next value is called iteration. These equations are incredibly simple to use. You literally plug in, use your calculator, and predict the next number. The hassle is if you want your final n to be 17 billion. Human beings are really, really bad at doing that kind of mathematics. We're actually better at solving differential equations as a species than we are doing a billion pieces of arithmetic. Computers, however, can do that pretty easily. I always would have made the point, you know, Newton would have killed a good number of people to get his hand on a single Excel spreadsheet. Okay, that would have been something that he would have he would have truly loved because it would have solved many things he couldn't even begin to touch. This is exactly, by the way, how numerical equations work. They always end up being, you plug in the value of the state variable on one side, and you get the value of the, next, of the state variable the next time on the other side. So that's called iteration. Notice this is not an equation in the sense that this is equal to that, more that, if you will, this it goes to that. So x0 goes to x1, x1 goes to x2, x2 goes to x3. So we just literally iterate along and predict what's going to happen with time. Now our time series here just looks like a list, and you saw that before. If I go back a few steps here, um, notice that this graph took these, which are difference equations. This side depends on xn and bn. This side is the next value of x and z. So if we plug in these values on this side, we can predict where we're going to be next. And when we do that, we just get a series of numbers. And those can be plotted. And that, that's the essential way this works. And a, a difference equation, therefore, is really handy if you have a computer. Now, here are the basic ideas, OK? And I'm just telling you this because I'm going to screw up and use the terminology. A difference equation that models a system is called a map. That's just a mathematical term. Okay, so a map literally is a difference equation. The difference equation being used as a model. The series of x values, x0, x1, x2, is called an orbit. That is a very specific use of the word orbit. You normally think of orbit as the circular path of how one small body circulates around another. That's not at all what it means here. This is just a special terminology. Not surprisingly, the math mathematicians created it. And it has nothing to do with the usage of the word in physics. So we thank them for that. But this is a simple idea. You simply tell me. So for example, if this map, suppose we had an amazing map. Now you want to make a lot of money? Here it is. We have a map f, a mathematical function of arbitrary complexity that if I feed in today's Dow Jones index, it will predict tomorrow's Dow Jones index. Okay? That's exactly what, what the economists would like to do, except they would acknowledge that they would need a bazillion equations, only one of which would be the Dow Jones index. And by the way, let me just say, uh, I know uh, several colleagues who've been uh, trained in multivariate statistics, right? So they know about how variables, like state variables, re relate to each other. And they know about how to compute equations and so on. They've gone into sociology first because they wanted to help change the world and make the world a better place, right? Uh, but then they got bought out and they now work on Wall Street trying to make that very equation for investors. What's funny is I've had a number of colleagues in grad school who became physicists or physical chemists and learned this model, and they now work on Wall Street trying to yeah. make the same decision. It's, um, certainly they make a lot more money than I do. Which is okay, as long right. as you remember your alma mater and, and give accordingly. Right. <laughs> That's right, then we're happy with you. So notice, by the way, guys, if you plot the value of x versus the step n, n acts like time. So you could think of time, if these, if these little 
variable, if these values of these variables are separated by a delta t, a little time interval like a month, okay, you would plot the value for a month. Now, why I put these shot to a month is because we're going to totally switch from a pendulum to a population model, okay? And so what we're going to do is we're going to have a simple model of an ecosystem called the Isle of the Bunnies. And on the Isle of the Bunnies, X will represent the population of bunnies. All right? Now, we're not going to let it just be a, a number. We're going to let it be rather what's called the population density. That means it's the number of bunnies divided by the carrying capacity of the island. Now, that's an important word you should all know. Carrying capacity means how many individuals can a particular environment support. So let me give you an example. There are 7 billion human beings on this planet. Using current technology, the estimate is the carrying capacity of the Earth is 11.5 billion human beings. The Earth, using our current technology, we are not capable of supporting more than that. Now, in case, in case you want to look at the right side of this, the current prediction is that the world population will max out around 2040 at 9.5 billion well below the carrying capacity of the planet, and of course technology can improve by that, assuming nothing happens. So that means we should be able to successfully pass through a population maximum on our way down to a lower equilibrium point. However, and given that we're a lot older than you, so you'll find this out, and Lauren and I won't have any idea what's going to happen, um, this could be heard in the following way. Suppose, for example, Okay, climate change changes, let's say, the weather of the American Midwest. So suddenly, the place where America grows all its crops becomes a desert. That would drop, in some sense, the carrying capacity of the planet. Okay, so we could suddenly, we could find ourselves, well, yeah, we've accelerated the right rate, but the capacity of the planet has changed. Now, of course, that's not possible. What happens is if, if the number of people see the carrying capacity, we instantly adjust. Typically, the adjustment is due to starvation, disease, and war. That is time-honored methods for human beings to adjust their population size. Okay? So that's what the word carrying capacity means. So how many bunnies could fit on this island given the amount of grass? <coughs> the key thing about this variable is notice it goes from zero to one. Zero being extinct, one you're at the carrying capacity. And that's commonly a way ecologists work. Okay? Now, I'm going to go back here. There it is. I somehow shot forward a whole bunch. Excuse me, I apologize. What am I doing here? All right, there we go. Population model. Okay. Um, so there are three kinds of behavior. I apologize that a, a determinist equation, that a population equation might produce. One would be a fixed point. That means eventually the value of x goes to a single value and doesn't change. 0 0.8, 0 0.8, 0 0.8, 0 0.8. 80% of the carrying capacity. Another possibility is a cycle. Here is a cycle called a three cycle, which simply means it has a period of three. So that we go 20% carrying capacity, 80% of carrying capacity, 60% of carrying capacity, back to 20. So if this were, for example, the yearly or monthly population of the bunnies. Now, the best way to work with an, eco uh, an ecosystem for a single species, most species have a typical reproductive cycle on mating season. Okay? So you could measure the population at the beginning or end of every mating season. And that would be the appropriate time interval between them. So notice that the, the, the population is changing but repeating itself. So this is a cyclic or periodic behavior. Then, God forbid, there's something called deterministic chaos. The population never repeats and seems to follow a random pattern. Before the 1970s, every physicist on the planet would have told you that was impossible. And then we figured out it was. 
okay? And the whole reason we did that was because this was behavior we were never going to see without computer modeling. And you've got to remember, the 60s are where scientists really first got their hands on computers for general purposes. The 70s, it got better, and that's when exactly we saw the phenomenon. So let's move on a little bit. So here's a very simple model. My current, popula my current population density is multiplied by a parameter r, which is just the number you set. Okay, so let's say it's 0.9. Okay, and you predict the next value. Notice that if r is less than 1, that means this population is going extinct. Because every time it gets smaller, it starts at 0.9, it ends up at 0.81, it ends up at 0.72 and it gets smaller and smaller and smaller. If R is one, the population stays fixed at the initial condition. So if we're initially at 0.6, it stays at 0.6. If the population is greater than one, if, sorry, if R is greater than one, this population will go to a fixed point of infinity, which is clearly the mathematicians got their hand on that one. All it means is the value of X goes to infinity. Okay, that is known as a driven system and it's unrealistic. No system can be driven forever. You simply run out of room. In this case, you could declare death to the world as soon as you hit the carrying capacity of one. As soon as x exceeds one, you know you're wrong. So this is basically a way too simple model. Instead, you go to this model. This model, notice, has the same piece, except now it has this guy. That term, one minus x, has a tremendous effect on the system. The closer x gets to 1, the smaller this term gets. Sorry, the yeah, smaller it gets, and vice versa. So this term supplies, there it is, a, if you will, a feedback into the system. The closer I get to the carrying capacity, the smaller the change in the system will be. So just to point out to you, if I actually were to expand that to this equation, notice I have a linear and a quadratic term, the key thing being this one is negative, so this increases the size, that decreases the size. We typically refer to the source of the growth of the system as the source. Whereas the second term is the source of decay, we call that a sink. So you hear this term sink and source. So if you use my water example, the drain is the sink, literally, and the faucet is the source. Okay, so it's the balance between these two. That's why this is a much better model. It has a way of increasing the population and a way of decreasing the population. Now, it turns out we want to keep one, x between zero and one, because that's the only thing that makes physical sense. It turns out that r, therefore, the parameter has to be kept between zero and four. If r is less than one, less than zero, negative, or greater than four, will go negative on the next iteration. Notice that's meaningless. The population can't be negative. Now this is a perfectly legitimate thing to have in a mathematical model. You restrict the values of the parameters so that your answer stays meaningful. <coughs> From a mathematical standpoint, no problem. Your population will go negative. What does it care? X will be negative. But we're interpreting X as a population, so we have to keep look at it only when it stays positive. And again, if you're worried about what the sink could be, it could be a population of predators. Okay, so we have foxes on the island. Now it turns out, I've always used foxes as an example, the best data for this system is to use, instead of foxes, lynxes. Okay, lynx are a kind of uh, predatory cat. Um, there is long-standing data on the populations of the Canadian snowshoe hare, a kind of rabbit, and lynxes. And the reason we know that is because trappers who have caught both animals and sold their fur have tracked their sales numbers since the mid 17th century. Okay. Wow, wow so that's cool. So, so they can go yeah. back just on the basis of that uh, data that wasn't accumulating for you know reasons of analyzing your ecosystem, and they can find okay. that. This is just literally the uh, the insurance company numbers, like Lloyd's of London, and I said the wrong thing, I apologize, not the 17th century, the 1700s. Mm -hmm. So right around from the time of the American Revolution, we just have this data because people just kept track in their business records. Mm -hmm. 
by the way, can, that this, Steve and I both come from Massachusetts, and there's an animal, an invasive, an invasive species animal in Massachusetts that I don't know if it eats bunny rabbits, uh, but it eats, if you can imagine this, um, well, it specializes in porcupines and stuff like that, but it can get cats, it can get house cats, and house cats are nimble and quick, so you imagine something like that. And uh, I believe it's called the fisher. Have you heard about the fisher? Um, I've heard of it. I don't know much about it. Though. Yeah, they're they're really nasty. They're they're big, and they they go after something. They turn it over. They disembowel it with its claws, and they start eating while this thing is still alive. And no, you, you don't want to be near them. Anyway, I just wanted to wake people up out there. You know, home stretch of the class here, and that, that's a true story. True story. Point out here. Um, but that can be a significant sink. The island of the bunnies is not mythical. Unfortunately, the island of the bunnies are said to be known as Australia. The rabbit is not indigenous to Australia. Colonists inadvertently introduced it. It has no natural predators. It has gotten way out of hand now. Really? I, I, was, I didn't know that. Wow. To the point where the Australians tried to introduce a predator. Okay? But not fox. The predator they introduced was a virus that would kill rabbits. Instead, all they discovered was a typical result of immune immunology, which is that no matter what the virus is, 20% of your population is immune. So they cut back the rabbits, but then all of a sudden they just simply come back a population that's completely immune to it. They're still stuck at the rabbit. That, that's a great story, and, and uh, Dr. Hamming, when she comes and talks about ecosystems and sustainability, she'll, she'll appreciate that. Let's remember that one. Yes, that's right. Okay. So all I'm going to do here is show you the behavior. By the way, that equation is called the logistic map, logistic as in supply and demand. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to change R and show you how the orbits change. And I'm always going to start at a fixed, at a uh, initial condition of 0.2. So with R equal 1.4, it starts here, and this system quickly settles into a fixed point at a little over 0.23. So that's nice fixed point behavior. When R equals 3.4, we start out at 0.2, but what happens is it rapidly settles into a four cycle. It goes this point, that point, that point, that point, and then it repeats itself. So notice the four cycle looks like a series of four lines. You can't reach four different equilibrium values. It's actually cycling between those four values. So you get a clear four cycle. So, now, those, are, so those are points, do you guys understand that? So those are points at which, what is happening? I mean, can you explain that again? Sure. It's, it's, words, it's going to a cycle where, let us say, the bunny population will go from 0.5 to 0.9 to 0.38, 0.82, and then repeat it. Whoops, sorry. And then repeat itself. So that's what happens. It goes through four different values and then it repeats again. So in other words, you have a, you know, four different years. In other words, this is like this, this is like this, this is like this, this is like this, and then it repeats itself. So populations are known to do that. You have an off year and an on year, okay? Depending on the nature of the cycle. And ecologists see this kind of stuff all the time. And, and R is representing what, in fact? R is representing, to some extent, the, it, it's very difficult to pin that down, but it's the balance of the growth and death rates. How fast can the population grow? Yes? Yep. Good. Okay. Now, this is all weird, but believe it or not, here's the weird part. That's what happens when R equals 4. There is no pattern here. Okay? There's no fixed points. There's no cycles. This is deterministic chaos. It looks random. If you took every hundred point, on this graph, so 0, 100, 200, 300, 400, 500, took enough of them, you could apply any test from statistics for randomness and it would pass. As a matter of fact, this equation is how you can, your computer can generate random numbers. 
Hmm. It can literally just do, iterate a hundred times, give you the number, iterate a hundred times, give you the number, iterate a hundred times, give you the number. Again, most scientists, most very good physicists would thought it was impossible. How could a totally deterministic equation, an equation where you literally fed a number into one side and kicked it out the other, how could that produce random values? There's no, there should be no source of randomness. Okay. So that seems really bad. And it turns out this went from, I guess I can see that, or oh, here's an example, to here's many examples, to literally most things in the universe actually behave like this. Okay, this is not a rare event. Most things you can point to do this in the long run. So and, 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 and just, just, just to get our heads around what is causing this. So this is where the rabbits reproduce so, so fast. No, 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 no. no, no. Okay, okay. Don't go there. Don't okay. Go. There's an interesting reason it happened. There's an interesting thing that's happened with the equations. And here it is. Okay. There's our logistic mass at r equal four, right? So I just replace r with four. This particular version of R equal 4 can be transformed after doing lots of math, which I have compassionately omitted into this equation. It's called the Baker's math. Here's how it works. Notice I have this function here called mod 1. Mod 1 is simply like, mod is like plus or minus or divides or multiplies. Except it says the following. Divide this number by that number and only keep the remainder. So, seven mod two, seven divided by two is three with a remainder of one. So seven mod two is one. Eight mod three is two because eight divided by three is two with a remainder of two. Everybody see that? Now we do this every day. We do it at 13 o'clock, all right? In other words, it's 13 o'clock in Canada, all right, Americans think it's 1 o'clock, all right, because Americans calculate time of the day mod 12. Even though the day has 24 hours, for whatever reason, we do it mod 12. So we go from, you know, we go from 1 <coughs> to 12 a.m., and then we go from 1 to 12 p.m. Everybody see that? Mm -hmm. yep. Okay, yes, no, I, I can't see you folks. Yeah, no, that's right, that's right, there they are. are you guys want to nod? Okay. You want to nod? Right. Notice why this is so easy, what this does for you though. Notice if I give you a number like 1.876. Mod 1 means just chop off the 1. Or 8.314, you know that, just chop off the 8. So mod 1 means chop off the integer part. So notice what this map does. It says take your initial condition, 0.2, okay, multiply by 10, 2.0, and do mod 1, which would make it 0. So you can really see that, and as a matter of fact, it's even easier than that. All it really means is you take this initial condition, you move the decimal point 1 over, and you chop off that number. So 1.41592654 becomes 0.41596, that I chop up the 1, then I multiply this number by 10, and I get, I just move that decimal place that way, and I get 4.1592654, again mod 1 it, chops off that part, so on and so forth. So all this map does, literally, is simply move the decimal point to the right, and erase the part on the left. So it simply literally clicks its way down the initial condition value. Now that may not seem that exciting until you start to realize what's happening. If our initial condition is a rational number, remember what a rational number is way back when for math, okay? It's a number that either terminates or repeats. If it's a terminating number, then eventually multiplying by 10 and, and chopping it off, multiply by 10, chop it off, multiply by 10, chop it off, it'll eventually go to zeros. If it's a number that repeats itself, it'll go into a cycle. It'll go from 0.321 repeated to 0.2121 repeated to 0.2. So this will go to another with the two cycle. It'll go from 
0.212121 back to 0.2121. So this will simply oscillate between one and two, between these two numbers. That's a two cycle. If my initial condition, however, is an irrational number, which means it's a number that neither terminates or repeats, it'll produce a string of random numbers. Because an irrational number is nothing more than a string of random digits. So in other words, if you start off with an irrational number as the initial condition, you will seem to produce a series of irrational numbers. Now, that doesn't seem that important until you realize the following thing the mathematicians have shown does. If you pick a number between 0 and 1, by throwing a dart, whoever you want, you will always end up with an irrational number. The irrational numbers outnumber the rational numbers by an infinite amount. They by a, by a what amount? By an infinite amount. The rational numbers take up no space between 0 and 1, even though there's an infinite number of them. They're all irrational, basically. Now, this is a really interesting problem, because any time we measure something in a laboratory, we always terminate the number. <coughs> yeah. But of course, the real the thing has a value that goes out forever. And it turns out, no matter how closely we measure that number, eventually, the part we left out is going to come back to haunt us. Similarly, even if we think about our little pendulum cheerfully moving around, eventually, if you go far enough out in the pendulum's initial condition, the effect of the gravity of the sun yeah. on that pendulum will kick in. So no matter how small that effect is, eventually it comes to affect the pendulum. And this was the horrifying realization in the 70s that there is a kind of behavior available to most mathematical systems, to most physical systems, that effectively goes random after a while. The, why we missed it was simply because the kind of equation you need to predict chaos can't be solved as a differential equation. So we did a process to approximate it and always approximated out the chaotic behavior. Okay? Yeah. So literally, it wasn't until we solved these things numerically that we saw the chaos. Now, this has been a huge conclusion of 20th century physics. We realize that most physical systems have some chaotic behavior. If nothing else, eventually, the initial condition can't go out far enough, or if they go out far enough, you can't separate the system from the surrounding. So and the Steve, outside view. Hmm? Well, is, is this, and I'm sort of including the class here in on this, and you can see the people. But does, does this, is this sort of like sensitivity to initial conditions? I'm, I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Is, is this like sensitivity to initial conditions? That's exactly sensitivity to initial conditions, yes. <coughs> you guys you guys read about that, right? Right, everybody, that's right, that's right, we read about that. Um, and so it's it's sort of like, uh, yeah, every, every system, I don't know how you guys would phrase it, but it seems like every system. The common system, name for this is the butterfly effect. Yeah. You guys have heard about the butterfly effect? I bet some of you have. Yeah, there's heads nodding out there. Yeah. The, uh, the effect of a butterfly's wings will change the weather of an atmosphere, uh, uh, the weather of a hemisphere eventually. The first person to do this was Lorenz. Lorenz realized that this kind of behavior was happening. And interestingly enough, was happening in the weather model. And it was fascinating. He had a very primitive computer. By primitive, I mean, I'm not sure you own anything with a microchip that would be as slow as this thing. <laughs> but he was a good enough scientist to say, what I'm seeing here is not a mistake. What I'm seeing here is a real physical phenomenon. And that was the first known example of seeing deterministic chaos. So the point being is this. Simple systems. 
simple little equations like the one I showed you can produce mindlessly complicated results. So we're stuck with a really interesting prospect. How do we distinguish between the complexity of the results of a single simple system and the complexity of the results from a complex system? So complexity is not just for big systems anymore. Even simple systems can show complexity. And again, it looks like this. Okay? And if you were to just keep doing this, you would simply see that every point between 0 and 1 eventually gets hit. And there's nothing you can do about it. And this is a mindlessly simple mathematical equation. I mean, look at this thing. It's a damn quadratic equation. That's all it is. You can plug this in yourself. E and point two, subtract it from one, get point eight, multiply by point two, multiply by r, bang. And, plug but, it back in. and uh, r, r is the, what is r? You want to tell us what r is? It's, it's, r is just a parameter. It's just a number. The point is we represent But on, on Bunny Island, though, in Australia. It, it, it's a growth rate. Yeah, it's a growth rate. Okay, but the key thing is this, it doesn't matter. You found out, you used this equation for whatever reason, and in addition to producing simple results, it's gonna produce complicated results. Any equation we use to represent any system in the world, whether it be a pendulum, a weather system, an ecosystem, an airplane, whatever, is capable under the right conditions of chaotic behavior. That was the, the, the horrifying discovery, that simple equations produce complicated behavior. My God, what are complicated equations up to? Yeah. So that, if you will, is the moral of the story. Okay, there is this ultimate kind of, of behavior called chaotic behavior, where the system is chucking along deterministically. It is a Swiss watch, literally. Yeah. But it still seems to be behaving in random fashion. So, Steve, is it happening because, don't you guys wonder this? I mean, why is it, why is it happening? I got a really simple machine, a, a Swiss watch. You know, I mean, why, why would that be happening? Why is it, uh, why am I on the board? <laughs> um, I wanted to show them a complex system. You know, the, um, it would be me on the board, but I guess not. Um, I, I mean, I'm just wondering, so where is it coming from? Why, why can you not have some really simple little thing and it's predictable? Why it is predictable in some cases, but not all cases. And the, the answer is, is what we just saw. It's the numbers themselves. Think about this for a second. Where does randomness come from? What this result says literally, look at the numbers between zero and one. You have a complete table of every possible random sequence in there. In other words, literally, put a decimal point, randomly pick a number between zero and nine. Do that forever. <coughs> you have one of the irrational numbers between zero and one. They're all there. There's no random sequence of numbers you can produce that it does not already exist between 0 and 1. So basically, nature walks around with a random number table. And certain kinds of models simply can show you the randomness that's present in the numbers. That was an amazing viewpoint. In other words, randomness, I had, I think, at the final like a question here at the end, they had a few questions. Um, can you see this? Yeah, hold on. Yep. You see exactly. this slide? Okay. Yeah. So if I go right to the bottom here, look at the questions here. This is probably the best way to do it. Why is determinate sometimes deterministic chaos is referred to as pseudo-randomness? Okay, in other words, all deterministic chaos is doing is literally completely mechanistically reading you a random a list of random numbers. Uh -huh. Is it, is it get the list of random numbers with the initial condition? Yeah. Yeah. So it's not random because there's a mechanism for producing those numbers. 
but, but it is random because it, it acts like any other sequence of random. There's no sequence of random numbers you can predict that my little equation can't reproduce. Mm -hmm. So this really blurs the line between random and deterministic. It shows you can actually have a system which shows the properties of both, which shouldn't have been impossible. Mm -hmm. But we found that in the 20th century. And realize, again, this, this, this today was not about any particular model. It was, a, it was a general result of any mathematical model whatsoever. It, it will event, it is capable of showing randomness. Okay. Well, Steve, thanks so much for our first time out of the game. Sorry, folks. Both, both of us doing a Skype class. That didn't go too bad. I think we we might need a little more view in the in the uh, uh, slide. Little, yeah, a little bigger size of view, um, just to see your your humanity there. I'm and smiling face. Yeah, I'm sorry if that's coming off like that. I don't quite know how to do this, but yeah, I know. Well, we're learning, and um, and I'll I'll email them the next the next reading uh, assignment. Um, um, yeah, it's gonna be the ones on. Um, did I say I gave you the one on cellular automata? Uh, you, I gave me slides, but I don't know if you I'll gave me the reading. But anyway, we'll talk and and I'll I'll email them. Great. Cellular Thomas right. is next. Yeah. All right. We'll be getting these slides. Yeah, and we'll post these slides, right, Steve? You can send them to me and I'll post them. I will go I will go back to my office, send you these slides and the next set of slides. Great. Great. Okay. Cool. All right. All right. See you Thursday. And uh, you and I you and I can email back and forth about the uh, the readings and stuff like that. I'll make sure I have that. Okay. All right, thanks, Steve. <laughs> yeah, don't you think we need more of his face there? He's sort of small in there. I don't know. I really enjoyed how close your face was. All right. Well, I'm just trying to give you this. Are you going to draw any quickly? Why didn't you nail that? Come on, Miguel. It'll come out in the wash. Well, but we actually, I do give extra credit to drop the lowest quiz grades. Okay. points, yeah. Well, good, guys. Thank you. <laughs>